The first big screen appearance of the F-14 was in the 1980 sci-fi adventure, The Final Countdown, which has gained fans and stature in recent years. We get the full story from former Tomcat pilot, Shoes Al Mullen. Shoes was a lieutenant in VF-84, and he had recently completed the Top Gun school when he was sent to Key West to film some unknown movie. He's a great storyteller. He describes how the movie maker struggled at first but then it all came together. And he also gives his impression of the famous scene where it looks like a tomcat almost flies into the water. Shoes also has amusing stories about his time in the training command and his later tour as a Top Gun instructor. You're gonna enjoy this wide ranging and entertaining interview, which is loaded with anecdotes about flight training, Top Gun and the F-14. So strap in, wheels up, we're going flying. Hey, welcome to the F-14 TomCast. We got a great show lined up today. My name's Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch. I used to fly the F-14. I was an F-14 pilot and a Top Gun instructor. And I'm Dave Baronic, call sign Bio. I was an F-14 Rio. I was also a Top Gun instructor, although a few years before Crunch was there. And I'm uh, your other co-host today. We have a great show. Our guest today was an F-14 pilot who joined the Jolly Rogers of VF-84 as a nugget in 1977. He was uh, picked out of the, of the uh, crew there, selected to go to the Top Gun class in 1978. And then a few months after uh, completing the Top Gun class in mid-1979, he joined a few squadron mates at Key West where they created the F-14's first big screen production that was the final countdown. So please uh, welcome Shoes Al Mullen. Shoes, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on today. Hey, hey Shoes, uh, you know, Crunch here. That is, it, it's, it's great to see you. It's great to, uh, it's great to talk with you. I know, you know, I've heard a lot about you. I heard you on other shows before. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all about the stories going back to filming what really I remember as being that first F-14 movie, you know, on the big screen, as Bio said. Now, let, let's back up just for the listeners real quick. I, before we get to the movie, how did you get into, what's your background before that? You know, what? how did you get into flying the F-14? Uh, well, I went through, um, uh, I, w I wanted to go to college, right? So uh, my parents, I, I'm actually from Scotland, believe it or not. This is not going to be a big bio, but um, I got into uh, uh, I got into the United States with my mother on the Queen Mary in 1957 as a little kid, like a like a five year old. So when I grew up, they you know university, going to college, all that stuff was completely foreign to my parents. And I, I came home from high school one day and I said, guys, I really want to go to college. And they said, well, how are you going to pay for that, laddie? I said, well, um, uh, there's this thing called Navy ROTC, and uh, there's if you if you get a scholarship there, they'll pay for your college. I might need a little help with the room and board, but other than that, I'm going to, I'm going to be a pilot in the Navy. That's what I'm going to do. My father says, well, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? But on you go. So that was, uh, that's how I got into the Navy and so forth. And uh, as far as getting into F-14s, um, I was, I had cheated a little bit. I had uh, taken some, um, some flying lessons early on. I flew the air, uh, I flew airplanes a little bit uh, for a charter company while I was in college. So uh, when I got to Navy uh, flight training, uh, I, that's a rule of fighters, by the way. You know, it, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So I didn't know the rule, but I guess I, uh, I just, you just uh, lived my it. inner, my inner self said there has to be a way to cheat. So since I had this, uh, this little bit of flying experience, my grades were really good. In fact, I think I was the number one guy at Meridian or whatever. So. Uh, and uh, a guy named Dale Snodgrass, God rest his soul, he had come through that training base earlier in an F-14 Tomcat and it just for the students to see it. And I climbed on it and I looked in the cockpit and uh, I looked at all the armament and the, it was just the coolest airplane I'd ever seen in my life. 
So by the time I got to the bottom of the ladder to get off it, I said, that's what I'm going to fly. And since my grades were good, uh, I asked for um, F-14s East. I went to the RAG there, VF-101, and that's where I learned to fly the Tomcat. Well, that's awesome. Okay, before that's before we get too far away, which college did you go to for Navy ROTC? Oh, it's uh, just a crappy little uh, school in upstate New York. I think it's called uh, Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> Heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Navy ROTC guy also. Crunch is a Naval Academy guy. I'm so. a Naval Academy guy, yeah. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> oh, sorry. That's a Naval Academy salute for anyone that doesn't know. It's interesting. It's interesting to uh, to as we're talking to different guests now to, to think how many you know have been uh, either ROTC or Naval Academy, and mm -hmm. uh, we're not keeping track, but we've had a lot of Naval Academy guys so far. So, shoes, it's good to have you here. Thank you. All right. I'm like, so I, I I can't hear you. I think you guys are cutting out. I can't hear the microphone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I always say to the, to, you know, when people ask me, uh, what Naval Academy guys ask me where I went to school, I always say that I decided to uh, continue my education after high school. So I went to the <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, so you're in VF 84. You, uh, you did a deployment. Uh, you know, let, let's, get a little background and stuff like that. What did you think of the Tomcat and, uh, and the F-14 squadron? You're, I mean, once you get into the fleet and you're flying the big uh, Tomcat, you know, t give us a couple of impressions and things. And, and we want to make people wait before we start talking about the movie, you know? You're right. Right. Well, the first thing to understand for anyone that hasn't been through uh, flight training is that you, before you actually go to the fleet, you have to go through something called the uh, replacement air group or the RAG. And that's where you learn to fly the F-14, you know, to begin with before you go to your fleet squadron. And in my case, the RAG was flying very early model F-14s. Frankly, they were all of the bugs were not worked out of that airplane yet. And um, I, I wasn't very fond of it, to tell you the truth, when I got out of the RAG. But when I went to my fleet squadron, it had brand new, they were called Block 95 airplanes at the time, had a lot of features that the RAG airplanes did not. And uh, I, from that point on, I just fell in love with the airplane. And, you know, with the, uh, got to find my skull and crossbones thing, with this on the tail uh, of the airplane and and the um, the VF-84 paint scheme, it was just badass, man. I'm sorry. It was just the coolest looking airplane ever. And uh, I was all proud of myself. So. Well, let's let's face it. If you were, if you were a kid like me, I was... You know, I was born in 1971, right? So when you were in VFA 84, I had, oh, come on. <laughs> you're a kid. When you were in you're VFA 84, I had the model on my on my table painted out with uh -huh. the, the, the line going down the side and the skull and crossbones. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So yeah, I know, yeah. I mean, everybody thought that that was the coolest looking airplane that was out there. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. No doubt about it. But uh, yeah, but of course, you know, you got to learn to, you have to learn, first of all, before you can go to the fleet, you have to prove that you can land the thing on a ship and not just any old ship, a ship in the middle of the night. So uh, that was an interesting uh, hurdle, you know, for me. And um, it worked out all right. I never thought the airplane was really hard to land as long as you just sort of, as long as you didn't do certain classic mistakes uh, then if you avoided that, I thought it was a pretty uh, good airplane to get aboard in terms of percentage of successful landings, but it was a difficult airplane to make look good. By that, I mean, it had a lot of control surfaces, a lot of things are moving out there. So the landing signal officers, the guy that grade your pass, they're looking at all this motion. And in the, especially in the beginning, they would give you a, uh, a, a lower grade than you thought that you deserved because they they just saw all this motion on the airplane. Later on, as more of the LSOs got into the F-14, suddenly my grades improved. Now, go explain that. You know, they were never, never trust paddles, right? Never, never. trust paddles. paddles never, so those guys stink. They do. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you need them. <laughs> Unless right. you got an engine out and the deck's moving. Then, you know. Yeah, you're on moveless. Yeah. Exactly. All right. And how were how was the guys in '84? Was that a, a good group of guys to match the uh, the colorful paint schemes and all that? Or 
Uh, it was, uh, it was, we, the whole squadron, um, kind of luckily for me, because, uh, of course I'm a, I'm a nugget, what's called a nugget. It's a brand new guy in the fleet, but the squadron had just transitioned from F4s to F14s. So the very experienced guys that I was flying with operationally, they were way ahead of me. But in terms of flying the F-14, we were really pretty much equals. They, they had just come through the rag the same as I did. And that was a break, uh, you know, for me. I didn't have the typical nugget, uh, dumbass reputation, frankly, because uh, I was because everybody was a dumbass in the F-14 and BF-84 at the time. But uh, within, you know, the first two, three months of our first cruise, uh, everyone had that worked out. I thought it was a great squadron. I, I enjoyed it. And, um, you know, what, what is there to say? Also, all my RAG classmates, uh, guys like uh, Bill McCluskey, you know, who you, maybe some of you know, or Ed Miller, you know, the guys that I went through the RAG with, we ended up as roommates in a six-man bunk room. So, uh, you know, for a year or so, I'm, I, you're sleeping within about 18 inches of your best pals, and you, you really get to be good friends. And, and we did. We did. It was fabulous. Great squad. Yeah, it's nice to nice to know your uh, squadron mates and just get mm -hmm. instead of just getting thrown in with a random bunch of uh, people. So, that's well, you, cool. you you learn to recognize their snore, you know. So even when it's <laughs> completely black in the room, you know who just got up. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chris, right. should we dive into the movie now? Go I'm ahead. Just gonna say that. Let's get into the movie. Bio, you kick it off. Okay. Shoes, give us a little bit of background on the final countdown as a big project, uh, as, as you remember. Now, you know, I, I'm sure you've looked up some stuff on either IMDb or Wikipedia over the years. But mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just the, your, your fighter pilot's recollection of, of where the movie came about. Sure. So the first thing to understand is that I was away going through Top Gun as a student, which at the time was a six week program. So I'm out in California with uh, Jim Houston, who was my, my Rio at the time. And um, we're fully immersed in just trying to get through the Top Gun class, uh, earn our patch, which is there, uh, earn our patch and, and all of that. So it isn't until kind of late in that six week period. Now we're starting to think about getting the airplane back home uh, to the East Coast because uh, Top Gun was on the West Coast. And um, we're talking to the squadron on the phone, you know, and they're saying, how the parts, the airplane flying okay? You need any help getting it back? No, I don't think so. And they said, oh, that's good because all the airplanes are gone. Uh, they're down in Key West making a movie. <laughs> they're what? <laughs> yeah, they're down in Key West. We're making this movie uh, about F-14s. So I actually got there like a week or two after this drill had started, and uh, which was not good news for my wife. I had been gone for six weeks. I came home, went to the house. Hi, honey. She said, oh, I'm so glad you're home. Now we can have some time together. I said, not exactly. I got back in the airplane, flew down to Key West, said, I'll call you. <laughs> that's, call the way the, that's the way the Navy is. So uh, I did find out uh, after I got down there that uh, uh, Kirk Douglas's son, Peter Douglas, who was trying to, I guess, become a producer of note, um, he had uh, managed to uh, talk to the, talk the Navy into... Uh, cooperating in the production of this movie. Uh, the Navy was wise enough uh, in this case uh, to think, you know, this could be a good recruiting uh, tool for us. At least for, we don't know about the plot, but at least a lot of people are going to see what F-14s look like, both flying and on the deck of the ship. So they agreed to do it. Um, the budget that they provided was a little slim, and that got us into a little bit of trouble later on. But um, it sounded like a fun project to me, and off we went to Key West. How did 84 end up being the squadron? Crunch, you got the next one. I just want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, That's how, was 84, how was 84 selected for the movie? Is there any? Uh... Best paint job in, in naval okay. history. I mean, you know, go all the way back to World War II. Uh, you know, the, the Hellcats that had the skull and bones on them were, were famous. It was already... Um, a logo that people were familiar with from the uh, Pappy Boynton TV show. You know, they had seen this logo before. And the um, our, our sister squadron, uh, that was the Black Aces, um, I guess perhaps that implied that 
you know, fighter pilots were gamblers or something. So I think that the Navy looked at the two logos of, that were available and they said, OK, uh, VF-84 is, is going to look better on camera. I assume that's why it happened. I don't really know that for sure. All right, cool. Oh, awesome. Well, so now let, let's think about this for a second. So you said you were off at Top Gun. Right. Um, you fly home, mm -hmm. say hi to the wife, leave again. You get down there, you're a week late. Yeah. Uh, everybody else has been down there. They're like, hey, we've been in Key West. Mm -hmm. We were here from the beginning. We didn't go to get, get to go to Top Gun, you know, mm -hmm. and Shoes shows up. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, he's flying the scene where <laughs> you're going against the zeros, right? Right. How did... How did you get the spot that you're actually one of the guys flying in one of the biggest scenes in the movie? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't remember. I, I honestly don't remember. We got down there and uh, we, we were, um, it didn't take long. What they were asking us to do uh, initially was really pretty easy flying. We were flying in formation, close formation. We were flying over that boat, you know, that, um, that there's another story that goes with that. But um, well, then they, they, then you have to tell us that story next. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to write you down. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, it really wasn't difficult flying. So we we pretty soon we started a rotation where, um, you know, there was a lot of guys coming in, going and so forth. As the flying got a little bit more difficult, like the, the zero shoot down shot and stuff like that, then we became much more specialized. And I was in the. Uh, the two oh three. Well, remember on the side of the airplane, it, it normally in a squadron you'd have like two hundred one, two hundred two, two hundred three, two hundred four, etc. But since airplanes go down for maintenance occasionally, we had three two hundred threes and three two hundred fours. You know, so that there was always a spare to go into the shot. But to get back to your original question, that, I, I had not thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's that's how it was. But I ended up being uh, flying the 203 Bird, which could have been any one of two or three airplanes with a 203 on the side. But um, that that made me the wingman uh, in the in the section of airplanes, the two plane that went out to investigate the zeros and so forth. Uh, a great friend of mine, uh, again, uh, God rest his soul. He's buried actually 400 yards where I'm from where I'm sitting right now in the uh, West Tennessee uh, Military Cemetery. Who is that? Uh, Fox Farrell. Okay. They, yeah, you may not have known him. He, he I'm not. Sure I heard of him. Was. Yeah, I, I remember the name from the old days. So. Yeah, Fox was a legend and and just a great guy. So he was the flight lead in. Uh, he would have been in 202, and I was in 203 for many of the shots that that we flew. I can't remember your. I can't really remember your question, so I probably didn't answer it. Do you want to repeat it? Uh, I think the question was: you had all the good deals. You went yeah. to Top Gun, then you come down, come down late, and then you still managed to get into the awesome shot. So I was just curious how you answered it. You said that it was kind of a random thing. You just got into a flow, and but mm -hmm. but then it sounds like you were the dude for um, for the wingman shot. The flight, flight of the zeros. So um, I guess, so I guess you had, you know, obviously there was some choreography to the whole thing, you know, right. I mean, what he went to the chalkboard, drew out some lines and said, Hey fellas, we're going to do this. And then mm -hmm. just, uh, did you have to do it a whole bunch of times? Or, I mean, talk, talk through the, uh, the film. Well, how did they plan? Yeah. How did they plan the uh, flying shots? Right. Okay. I'm going to back up just a tiny little bit to answer your, your earlier question, but it won't take a second. Remember, uh, yeah. I had gone on cruise with the squadron, and it was a long cruise. It was a nine-month cruise. So by the time I came back and went to Top Gun, I wasn't a new guy anymore. In fact, a lot of the, the older guys in the squadron had rolled off and done something else, and there was considerably uh, – there, there were quite a few guys junior to me in terms of experience in the F-14 by the time we got down to do the movie. So that may help to explain I wasn't yeah. really the new guy. Uh, by the time we, we got to that. So that was that. So as far as setting up the shots, so there was um, an aviation director that the movie had, had uh, that the movie company had hired. And this guy was really, really good. He thought in three dimensions. He was a helicopter pilot and a damn good one. And uh, he's the one that sat us all down and he said, all right, I'm going to be in the helicopter. And we're going to have the cameraman in the back of the helicopter. 
So it's up to you guys to get yourself into the shot because, you know, the helicopter is doing like 60 knots tops. And uh, we're obviously going much faster than that. So it became a timing exercise. And then we were going to try and, uh, uh, you know, fit ourselves into the script, which was this intercept of the zeros. So as I've said before, we spent our first, um, I would say the best part of two weeks wasting our time, wasting money. There's an F-14 goes by and then there's a helicopter and then there's a zero. It was the the aviation choreography was very, very difficult. Uh, And trying to take the pictures from a stationary thing, a hovering helicopter that is being somewhat blown across the water and then the F-14 trying to use their radar to find this small target, get in the right position to have the ship in the background. It was ridiculously hard. And we ended up with, uh, frankly, a, a lot of um, uh, film. Now, remember, this is the film days, not the video days. Uh, we ended up with a lot of film of water and, oh, what was that? Oh, that was a zero. You know, uh, a lot of bad shots. So that's what, after we'd wasted time and money, it was then that the video company decided to uh, lease the, um, the B20, uh, B-25, yeah, the, the B-25, you know, kind of Mitchell airplane um, that was built as a camera platform. In fact, it did a lot of the, um, the uh, photo, uh, photography for the final, uh, I'm sorry, not the final countdown, but the flight of the Phoenix, if, ever, if you'd ever seen that, that movie probably not you guys are younger than me but um anyway it was built as an aviation photography platform and that was good okay so another thing crunch i'll let you ask about the boat story in a minute but (laughs) tell us about the zeros where did they get where did the uh, airplanes come from uh yeah they were t6s and uh they belonged to uh what was then the confederate air force now renamed the commemorative air force they come out of uh, south texas that's their their base down there they do a lot of air shows and uh they kind of remind people of the world war ii uh, vintage airplanes and uh, that so they were actually not zeros at all uh because zeros are very very rare they the 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 commemorative air force only had one zero and i saw that airplane i was in the hangar with it beautiful airplane but they only had one of them so they had to make T6s look like zeros. They were the same T6s that flew in Tora, 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 if you remember that movie. Oh, yeah. And pretended uh, to be yeah. zeros. So uh, that's where uh, that's where they came from. And their top speed was 150, 180? More like, more like 140. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> and of course, you know, to make it worse, everything about moves is hard, but... They want that they had the uh, the Japanese actors were you know sitting in the in the zeros and they had a scarf and they wanted the white scarf to be kind of flopping out the window. So when they swapped out the Japanese actors and the other uh, the the U.S. guys that were actually flying the airplanes, they wanted the canopy open so that it would make sense that the white uh, that the white scarf was flying out the window. So all that does is slow down the airplane. So the airplane that, as you said, would, could probably do 140 pretty easily, it's got the canopy open and now it's doing 130 on a good day. And then they go to the F-14s and they say, can you guys fly at 130 knots? We say, oh, sure. Yeah, no problem. We can do that. Flaps might be down a little bit, but we can do that. So we go out the first day and they said, wait a minute, sweep the wings back. I said, <laughs> Wait, all right, time out, time out. We can fly at 130 knots or we can fly with the wings back, but we can't do both at the same time. And uh, that created all kinds of other troubles. So so the F-14s had to fly a lot faster than the Zeros in order to have the wings fully swept. And that created a lot of blank film because if you get the timing, just a little bit, the F-14s are through and you know the, the Zeros haven't shown up yet. And it, it was just a... A very difficult thing to do, but we got better at it, but it was hard. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I'm i sure we've all done it where you get out there and you're in some fleet exercise or something, and you go out there to actually intercept the low, slow flyer who's attacking yep. the ship, and, and you go out. Now, I've done that, and I can tell you, you know, when you intercept that low, slow flyer, mm-hmm. um, it's 
a challenge to not mm -hmm. fly out in front of the guy, right? And so you'll come zinging by, even if you're as slow as you can. And now you got to pop the nose straight up, right? Yep. And then you're rolling back around and a barrel roll to come back around. And then, you know, sometimes you get, you, there's that one scene where you look at him like, oh, that guy got the nose buried. <laughs> Been there, done that. I mean, we, we, we all have, it's so hard to fly a, a tactical fighter and intercept that low, slow flyer, which is really what these guys are. I mean, yeah. I, I can only imagine how hard that was to do while trying to film and be in this space of, of the you, camera. You couldn't possibly be more right. I mean, you're absolutely yeah. right. The other thing is, you know, the only way to prevent the overshoot, as you said, is to pull up to slow down the airplane. Well, those T6s are pretty small. It, it's not impossible to lose sight of the airplane that you're trying to fly off of. So now we have to find them again, or your wingman's trying to talk you onto it. Uh, I can't tell you how many, you know, thousands of gallons of gas, you know, uh, or jet fuel uh, we burned trying to uh, get those shots. And that led, there's a, you know, kind of a sub story. Uh, there was some cost overruns with that movie that, you know, created problems later on. But a lot of it comes from exactly that. We just couldn't all get in the same piece of sky, keep sight, get the orientation right. It was difficult flying. It, it really was. And the other thing too, you know, people may, may not, notice this or realize this but uh typically fighter pilots of air force or navy we really don't like flying over the water because there isn't a lot of texture to the water and if you don't if you lose track of your altimeter your your altitude indicating device it's very easy to get lower than you really thought you were Whereas if you're flying over the desert or the land, you know, when the cactus uh, get really big, then you're really low. So it's a lot easier to control that. And um, that made for a lot of retakes and some close calls. Uh, one of them's in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good question. So you, it, I don't know, were you, were you part, were you flying when there's that one close call, the, the footage? You, was <laughs> that was, your airplane? Was that you? No, it was my wingman. And I was, my posture was, oh shit! <laughs> I'm watching, I'm watching, oh man, that was Fox, that was Fox Farrell uh, that uh, flew that. And again, he was a great pilot, and if he wasn't, he probably would have hit the water. I mean, it well, was, well, I, I got to. We've all been there where you come around the low slow and you get your nose buried. I mean, I've been that guy where you're like, yeah. oh, wow, that was close. I yes. am so glad I made it. And how, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you know, how close was he? I've heard numbers out there. I'd like to hear from you. How close was he to, how, how much gravy did he give himself? <laughs> well, let, remember I told you that I was in a bunk room with six guys. Well, the Rio in the back seat was a guy named Frank Ross, and he was in the same bunk room as me. In fact, he was the bunk yeah. over for me. So it didn't take very long for, you know, to pull uh, Frank aside and say, hey, man, uh, did, did you have a little toilet accident back there? Or, you know, how did that go? And uh, he, you, Frank was a very deadpan, very funny guy. And he said, I just thought we were dead. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no, I mean, nobody said anything. You know, there was no point in saying, you know, Fox pull up or, you know, hey, you're really low. There was no point. I mean, he, yeah. he was there. He was either going to fix it or he wasn't. And yeah. I, I saw the whole thing and I, we all thought it was a goner, but he pulled it out. Yeah. Well, it's just a testament to, you know, the, being able to recognize it and recover, because I, t I tell you, I mean, everybody has mm -hmm. at some point or another gotten in that point where you're like, wow, I did mm -hmm. not mean to go right there. And I just mm -hmm. made a mistake, but I recovered. That's great. And I've certainly had Rios that have said to me afterwards, been like, hey, Crunch, um, mm -hmm. let's not do that again. <laughs> you know? I, I want to go home at the end of this. Let's not. Do how that. many? I wonder how many G's Fox pulled when he did that. Nobody. Talked. Well, not that many because he was pretty slow. You know, that's oh, okay. the thing. It was more a question of keeping the uh, keeping the wing ventilated. You know, and not yeah. uh, you yeah. know not over G the airplane. Yeah. But for any like flight students who are out there, or anyone who you know wants to be a pilot someday, if you ever see that that scene in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. They do this loop. They depart from controlled flight. They're pointed down at the water. But in the pullout that missed the water, if you look carefully, the airplane is perfectly wings level, which is what you have to do to miss the ground uh, in a situation like that. And in unusual latitude recovery, every flight student in the world, you know, is taught to do that. So 
uh, our man, a great man, Fox Farrell, uh, that I was telling you about and a great friend of mine, I told you he was a good pilot. And that is the mark of it. That airplane didn't have one half of one degree angle of bank on it. It was zero. And he was maxing it out. That was, that's, you know, we all know that, right? Yep. And it was Shoes, kept right at home. Yeah, Sorry? that's right. Shoes, I got to tell you, that is spot on. And uh, it's it's funny you say that because you, you mentioned, hey, but anybody out there who's listening, who's uh, maybe learning to fly or is a, maybe a, a civilian pilot or something. And, and you're, you're absolutely right because you go back through whether you're flying mm -hmm. fighters like we all did mm -hmm. or like I, I do now, like I fly, I fly the Airbus uh, uh, on when some when people pay me to take them places mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the A320 is a big giant airplane. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We practice unusual attitudes that say, when you are, when this happens, right. roll wings level to the horizon and mm -hmm. pull up level because you get all that wing under you. Just like you said, exactly. absolutely, absolutely true across aviation. Very, true. Very good yep. point. So now uh, bio mentioned it, you brought it up. What's up with the boat? Tell us the book. <laughs> well, uh, Catherine Ross was the uh, the female interest, you know, in in the movie, and uh, Charles Durning, I think, was supposedly her boss in the movie. Well, you know, Catherine Ross in the day she was she was kind of a babe. Her boyfriend was in the movie with her. I think it was called Lifeguard uh, or bo Bodyguard or something like that. So. She's down there and we're thinking that, and we were all staying in the Casa Marina Hotel, very nice hotel in Key West. We were not in the BOQ because there were so many of us, there would have been no BOQ rooms left for any you know, regular Navy pilots. So we're all in the same uh, hotel and that's where we went to watch the, the shots from the previous day, you know, every night. And we're thinking, well, we're going get, to get to meet Catherine Ross and since we're Navy pilots, obviously she's going to ditch the boyfriend and she's going to glom on to one of us. You know, that's the way we thought. Well, it, it didn't happen. I don't remember ever seeing her in person other than seeing her on the boat. We just never saw her at the thing. And um, they were so tired of it. They told us to fly as fast as we could, as loud as we could over the boat. So we're clearing the top of that boat by maybe eight feet, 10 feet. And she's on it. And uh, she, you know, she almost lost her hearing, you know, over <laughs> that whole drill. I mean, uh, it, so they got really, really tired and, of uh, noisy jets, you know, flying by. And, and the fact that, you know, I was or whenever we did have a chance to talk to him, we always reminded them, uh, madam, that is the sound of freedom, in case you're wondering what that sound is. Somehow the sense of humor just didn't break through, you know. So anyway. <laughs> I didn't think much of her or the boyfriend by the end of that movie, and none of us did. But who? She's probably a nice person. But um, anyway, <laughs> she, she just she uh, just didn't like it. <laughs> Catherine Ross, if you're catching this episode, uh, contact us. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, we'll, we would we'll love hear to hear your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, baby. <laughs> if you'd have bought it, if you'd have bought us one beer at the bar, all of would have been good. You know. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, let's go to the B twenty five. Once the B twenty five showed up, uh, what? Yeah. How did you guys? Uh, or how? How did that go? A uh, total game changer. Just total game changer. As soon as that thing showed up, now the zeros were flying. As I said, about one hundred and thirty, best they could do. B twenty five was very comfortable at one hundred and thirty. So now, if you imagine the B twenty five is a little bit out in front of the formation. And the tail gunner, they took out the tail gun and put in the tail camera. So he's flying along in a you know formation like this, and the zeros are stable in the in the um, in the uh, the shot. So now the F-14s are going past the zero. So that's that's like trying to get you know two pool balls to hit. That that's easy. When you go to three pool balls, it gets really hard on the table at the same time. So um, that made all the difference in the world. Prior to that, all we really did was waste fuel. But as soon as that airplane showed up, everything uh, was made much, much easier. So uh, we were happy to see it. And um, I don't know if you, in one of the other things that, that I did on this, uh, my wife was down in Key West at the time. And because uh, she, was, she was, by this point, bitterly complaining about the fact that she didn't even recognize me anymore because I'd been gone for so long. And she was, what really broke the camel's back, she was threatening to go out with a Marine. 
I said, oh. all right, all right, that's it. <laughs> I'm only kidding about it. I'm you, only should, kidding. <laughs> you should have told her, yeah, well, I'm about to go out with Catherine Ross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, shoes, that's a good tactic. <laughs> so I, mean, I, I, actually, French, that's a good... I actually went to the movie company and I said, look, guys, um, you know, I'm enjoying making the movie and you're nice people, but I really don't, don't want to get a divorce out of this. So you get two choices. Either I'm going back and you're going to have to fly another guy down to figure out how to be the 203 guy. Or you can fly my wife down here for a couple of weeks and, and uh, take the pressure off. And that's what they did. So they, they brought her down. We, now nice. we're all at the Casa Marina. That was nice. So we're walking out to the, uh, to the F-14. And, uh, you know, typically your wife, you know, they don't get all close to that stuff, you know. So I got all my gear on and masks and flaps and G-suits and all kinds of things. And we're walking out. We walk past the F-14 and she sees this old bomber thing. She says, what's that? I said, oh, that's a... That's an old bomber airplane from World War II, vintage, and we're using that as a camera program, uh, camera platform. You want to see it? Just sure, I guess so. Uh, so we walk over. We get a little closer to the airplane, and the pilot kind of slides back his window and yells down to me. He says, "Hey, shoes, uh, who's the babe?" I said, uh, "That's that's my wife." Oh yeah. Uh, does she want a, a little tour of the airplane? I said, "Yeah, she she would." So I, we kind of walk under the airplane. The, uh, they opened the bomb bay doors or the hatch doors. That's how they got in it. And these four hands come down out of the airplane, grab my wife by the shoulders, and just pull her up into the plane. They close the thing. <laughs> and off she goes. And I went, holy crap. <laughs> that was <interesting. laughs> so she got a flight in the, uh, in the B-25. And uh, that, was the, uh, that was the day that they were they were trying to film the refueling uh, probe of, of the F-14. So uh, I don't know, probably 25 minutes later or so, I'm up behind behind the B-25, maybe 10 feet behind it. Uh, they've got the uh, camera guy is sitting in the gun, gunner position with his with his camera, and over his uh, would be his right shoulder. There's my wife going. Oh, that, that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. And um, then I don't know if you want me to get into the, this, uh, this camera guy, but um, he was a very cool guy. And he had, you know, he had done a lot of dangerous filming. He was kind of a daredevil and all that. So anyway, I can't talk with, I can talk to the cockpit crew, but I can't talk to, to this guy. He's in a different station. So this is like, he's got an intercom to the, to the cockpit, uh, but not a radio, right? So the pilot says to me, hey, the camera guy, he wants to touch the refueling probe with the, the end of his foot, with his toe. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, okay, what when you get court-martialed for touching a guy's toe in flight with the thing. You know, what's going to happen here? You know, because as you guys know, at, you, don't, you don't see this in the daytime, but at night you sure do. When the probe gets near to the drogue, which is the thing that's going to give you the gas, when it gets, I don't know, maybe uh, I'd say about two or maybe three feet apart, there is a static discharge. It's quite bright. And obviously there's a lot of volts in there. And um, it neutralizes the charge of both the airplanes. So I explained to the pilot, I said, look, the guy doesn't want to do that because he's going to get a shock that's going to go into his toe and out his brain or something. And I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So they call me back. So there's a little conversation. I can see the, the, uh, the, the guy in the camera the, in the gun situation. He's just yapping away. So the pilot says... He doesn't care. He just wants to tell his friends that he did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that's it. I mean, if, I don't care. You know, we, if we're going to be, if we're going to be fighter pilots, we, I, you don't become a fighter pilot to do normal regulation stuff. Right. You, you know, when you get a chance, you say, oh, screw it. You know? So uh, anyway, I put the probe out. I, cl I, I close up on this guy. He sticks his toe out, and sure enough, right about you know about that far from contact, I see him go. Ah! <laughs> you know, off he goes. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> but he lived, you know, he lived, and that was fine. And uh, 
uh, it, it turned into a, a great, I'm, that guy's still telling that story, you know, to this day. I guarantee it, it's, it. it's the fighter pilot version of a Christmas morning scraping your, your wool socks across the carpet and walking up to your wife. And <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, but it's, it's, it speaks to the mindset, you know, that people would say, well, why would you do that? What if, the, if you actually did injure the guy, you know, et cetera? Well, when you live your life flying off of aircraft carriers at night, intercepting Russian bombers, flying at low altitude across countries where you're not supposed to be just to see if, if they can track you with their radar. When you live a life of uh, high risk, like, like we've all done on the ship, you don't worry about stuff like that. You know, you just say, hey, I told the guy. He said, no, he wants to do it. Now it's on him. And, and that's how fighter <laughs> pilots think. You know, we just we just do stuff. Now, I'm sorry. I can't help it. Got to be a dig. I'm talking about Navy pilots here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Air Force pilots don't do shit. <laughs> They're not allowed on this podcast. Is <laughs> oh, I'm going to be hearing about this now for months. <laughs> several guys in my, I've got this little company. We do, we do training for the, the military, but several of them are Air Force uh, pilots. So I'm going to be hearing about it. <laughs> are you trying to bring them around and loosen them up a little bit? Or? Nah, I, you know, there's no hope. You, you can't. That's, that's like, uh, you know, converting a goat into a greyhound. I mean, it's just, you can't do it. <laughs> Wow. Well, our audience is going to love that because it's an F-14. Yeah, yeah, it. It's an F-14 exactly. Tomcast, so they're Navy guys. <laughs> Navy fans. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so you flew, you know, all uh, the, the boat scene, the uh, chasing the Zero, the air refueling. I mean, when it was over, did they say, okay, that's it, we're done, get back to real life, or or – did you get involved in any of the other scenes like the, uh, the air wing, uh, strike when they filmed the whole air wing, were you a part of that? Yeah, I was, um, I was uh, sitting in the, in the ready room. You'd have to know where to look, but I'm in one of the ready room chairs when the captain is given the briefing over the ship's TV thing. And there's another thing that happened to me, you know, I hate, I think we're all like this. I'm not unique in this, but I hate to make mistakes. You know, I really do. I'm every day I'm trying to do everything just right. And I got yelled at one time uh, when I was in VT-1. Now, this is your very first squadron. And um, so you, uh, I'm trying to remember now. So we're in T-34s and there's what's, what the Navy calls a plane captain, what the Air Force would call a crew chief. And he's out there. And when you're ready, uh, ready to go, you know, you either give him a signal like this, which is pull out the chocks or you give them a little salute, which means that you're getting ready to come up with the power. Well, the commanding officer of the squadron of VT-1 is sitting in the back seat, and he's heard that I'm a good student. So he's there to, he's there to watch me. Well, I kind of went, you know, like that. And, uh, you know, half-hearted salute. And he, I, the airplane moved about an inch. Brakes jumped on. Stop. This, this Navy captain gets on. He's on the intercom. He goes, that was chicken shit. Don't you ever, ever, ever do that again. You have to make precise hand hand uh, signals to the people on the flight deck so they know what you're talking about. And that was wimpy. And I said, well, sir, I'll never do that again. <laughs> so now fast forward to the ship. They're taking a lot of pictures of uh, F-14s going down the catapult, getting launched. And I was in the habit because of that incident. I didn't go like that. When I was ready to go down the catapult, I snapped it in and snapped it out. And then off, off I went. So you'll, if you watch the movie, there are several scenes where some dork is giving it the hard, you know, the hard salute. That's me in every case because of this incident that happened, you know, back in the training command, I've still, I still haven't gotten over it. You know, I don't, I don't like to be criticized. <laughs> Well, so, I, you know, I guess. So, so I'm sorry, I'm getting back to you. That was a very, very long answer to a short question. But um, uh, in the, if you see the movie, anytime there's that catapult shot, there's a, a lot of pictures of me in there because I guess they, they like the salute part. 
they liked your salute and you had the helmet, you know, the 84 yeah. helmet. So yeah, the yellow that's helmet. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, hey, is it, so lots of stuff in there. Um, looking back at the end of it, you said, wow, that was so, so cool. Is there is there anything you would have changed where you said, well, if I were in charge, you know what I would have done instead? Mm. Were, there, were there some different flying scenes or anything you would have changed? Well, uh, the first thing I would I would have had the uh, the B twenty five there sooner. I think I I think that could have been anticipated uh, better, and uh, that would have saved a lot of fuel and uh, a lot of money. Um, I think that some of the shots that were. Like the flying shots speak for themselves. You know, the F-14 is very cool. We had a great paint scheme and we flew those as best we could. I don't I don't know that there's much I could do with that. There was some kind of cheesy shots that were shot on the ship, you know, between the captain who was Kirk Douglas and, you know, the the um, weather officer and, and so forth. There were also some radio calls that were cheesy. Uh, but ah, really, give us the good stuff. Yeah, yeah all the yeah. all the cheesy Hollywood. Yeah. But you know the yeah. audi the uh, the movie. audience. Yeah, the, the, you know stuff. the audience people that you know they don't know that you know it was yeah. just kind of uh, irritating, I guess. Uh, you know to us uh, that and you know, never mind. I, it, there's just no point in getting into it. Um, you know how we are. We're, we're so uh, we are as a group as a species. We are very proud of what we do, what we're capable of doing, uh, what we try to do right every single day. And when somebody messes with that just a little bit, you know, it, uh, it annoys us, you know, that we're just, just that way. Sorry. But I did think, uh, honestly, if you take a couple of steps back, you forgive all of that. I think the movie was a great uh, endorsement for Naval Aviation I thought, especially for the F-14 Tomcat, there were some great shots in there. There were good pictures that were taken off of the carrier. I think it brought the the viewing public a lot closer to what actually happens in the modern uh, aircraft carrier because they've you know they've all seen Tora 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 and all that World War II stuff. Now they're they're into the Cold War era, and uh, we had some very cool stuff that we flew very very well. So I, I was proud of that. Uh, of the uh, well shoes i was a student in the rag at 124 at miramar when it came out and my recollection i thought it was cool i think my fellow rag students thought it was cool too so you guys did a nice job so uh remind me again remind us again what you did uh or what was your SME area what was your lecture at top gun Ah, okay. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. So I did, um, I did uh, following my tour in VF 84, my fleet tour, as we would call it, I did, uh, report back to Top Gun as an instructor and I started, um, and each, each, uh, instructor gets a certain lecture. And I started out with a technical one, which was the aim seven, which is the radar guided, uh, missile, the Sparrow. Uh, so I was the uh, radar missiles expert and, uh, they sent me to, um, uh, up to uh, Raytheon in um, New England somewhere. And I went through the AIM-7 school and I kind of became an expert on that that weapon. And that was my first lecture. As time went on, uh, your lectures become uh, less technical and more tactical. So uh, I, you know, I ended up uh, giving the lecture on uh, combat section tactics, which oh, is... Oh, that was a good one. Well... That's like the heart of the course. It is. And it's so hard, you know, that because there's so many different things that can happen. Um, you know, one guy has a tally on the enemy aircraft and the other guy doesn't. That changes everything. You have to be able to fly another airplane with your radio. Uh, it's a skill and um, it's a hard one to teach. So uh, I... The only thing I can say about being at Top Gun as a student, I was also the training officer uh, there, which is kind of the guy that runs the class um, for my last year uh, there. And um, all I can say is that um, that was the, the high point, you know, of my life as far as, um, you know, doing something important, you know, in the military. But when my tour ran out, and I went uh, back to the East Coast to find my wife and reconstruct the old marriage thing. Um, I can tell you, I've never, ever been so exhausted in my life. I was done. 
I drove out through the gate at Miramar at the end of that three year tour. And I just remember thinking if I had to do this for another month, I couldn't do it. I was just wiped out. So that just to let people know, you know, Top Gun uh, as an as a student is very hard. It's also extremely hard as an instructor. And we took our jobs very seriously. Great stuff. Great stuff. What, so, uh, Shoes, what, uh, what are you doing these days? Um, well, uh, you, you uh, flew for the airline, obviously. Which airline was it? I, mean, uh, I fly for American Airlines. American Airlines. Okay. Yep. So um, I had a different idea. You know, I didn't really want to be borrowed. You know, I, I wanted to, to come out of, of this life with a little bit of money in the bank. So I didn't want to meet a flight attendant, you know, have an affair, get a divorce, pay the alimony. There's a way... <laughs> There's a way to avoid all of that. You, you can, can just choose not to do that. You, no, no, no. That's not going to work. That's not going to happen. But if you go to FedEx, you know, now you, you, you don't have those distractions. You know, you just pick out a nice, nice shapely box, you know, from the back of the thing and carry it to your hotel room and put it on the bed with you. You know, that's that's what you do. So uh, you can you can cut all this out. By I know you want. Oh, no, this is staying in. Yeah. Yeah, let's stay in. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I uh, I was a pilot at um, at FedEx for geez I don't know how many years thirty eight years I think um, oh, wow. a lot of that I know. so and I while I was there I ended up in um, in uh, the uh, crew resource management department I volunteered for it I thought it would be interesting everybody else ran away like little insects you know but I thought it was interesting human factors how do we relate in the in the cockpit it kind of took me back to my uh, Top Gun experience because. Pilots and Rios have got to communicate carefully. Pilots and controllers have to communicate carefully. And I was really interested in it. And um, so I got involved in that. And when uh, when I left that program, went back to regular line flying, I thought, you know, um, the, the people came to our course, like the Air National Guard or, you know, some Air Force guys came through. And I thought, you know, we could, it's a good course. We could sell this stuff. So I, I got permission from FedEx to start a company outside and unrelated to my FedEx job and uh, declared all that and complied with all the requirements. And I formed a little company to, to teach uh, sort of combat CRM to the Air National Guard, uh, eventually the Air Force, Air Force Reserve, and so on. And then that market's only so big. So as years went by, we said, well, if we can teach that, we can teach anything. So um, I have a company now called Crew Training International. Uh, we have about uh, 450 employees. Uh, we're really all over uh, the U.S. on various Air Force bases. And we provide what's, what uh, is called combat um, air crew training and courseware development. So we develop courseware and teach to military uh, units everywhere. And uh, that's what we did. Turned into... Turned into kind of a, a nice, it was a beer money company. And uh, now it pays for like cases of beer. So that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> the I good stuff it. too. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're proud of the yingling now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm proud of that too, you know, because, um, you know, our, our guys have been in, uh, and now you forget about the Air Force Navy thing. You know, it doesn't matter who our customer is. They're, they're Americans and, we want to see them uh, not get shot down, not end up captured somewhere, uh, do their jobs to the best of their ability. And uh, I, I love it. I mean, I just love teaching that stuff. It's, it's good fun. Shoes, good you have fun. continued to serve. And yes. that's, that's something I'm quoting Jello. Uh, that's, a, that's a philosophy he has. Jello's the guy, Fighter Pilot Podcast, who sponsors us. I see. He, yeah. 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 He's, he's the backbone to our show. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's a, continued to serve just like uh, that's something he says. So, yeah. What were you going to say? Sorry. Yeah. I, you know, uh, once you have been in the military, if you, if you stay on beyond, beyond your just your very basic commitment and you really get into the life, it it really affects the way you think about everything. You know, I, I told you my friend Fox Farrell's in the military cemetery, three or four hundred yards that way. Well, I come off the highway down the road a couple of miles and I drive by that cemetery every single day coming to work. Every time I drive by, I salute all of our, our honored uh, so, uh, men, soldiers, sailors, airmen uh, that served. And once you get that in you, you it's never coming out. 
I mean, I, I, oh, I can't, good. I can't drive past. I try to drive by the, by the gate saying, well, I've been, this is my third time by today. They're probably down, you know, in the graves, they're probably getting tired of having to return this salute. So maybe I'll just skip it. Can't do it. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's the way it is. I don't think they're tired of it. I think they appreciate it. <laughs> uh, that I hope so. I hope yep. so. But it's an honor. It, it's just a damn honor. Uh, first of all, to live in this country and then to serve in the military of the United States, uh, it doesn't get any better. It just doesn't. I, you know what? I was get, One thing to close out, I, I, and we'll see what our audience says, but I've perceived there's renewed interest in the final countdown in the past couple of years. I mean, yeah. just from yeah. traffic on Facebook and, and questions and things like that, you know, uh, I wrote a magazine article with your, or a, a web article with your cooperation a couple of years ago, and then you mm -hmm. done uh, other podcasts and everything. So I think uh, you're, you're keeping the legend alive. Well, here, you know, that I think the, the point that I would make about that to, to sort of capitalize on what you just introduced without a uh, final countdown, I don't think there ever is the Top Gun movie. Ooh. I think that's, you know, people saw Final Countdown, uh, Paramount uh, Pictures, you know, saw the, uh, you know, I've got a little background in that, too. I don't get too far into it, but um, that movie came out. Uh, Paramount got interested in that. There was also a freelance writer in uh, Hollywood who wrote an article on the Top Gun class. I took him up in the F5F in the back oh, yeah. seat. I've got that article on my website, the whole there, article. Yeah. With yeah, one of the it, students, uh, Yogi Hanarkas, who was in that class. Yeah. Oh, okay. He helped me get the article. And, and I remember your name is mentioned in there. Yes. So, uh, and they, uh, uh, Paramount later on that I was, um, you, do you guys know Jim Houston? You, you remember? Well, I've him? emailed him. I, I know emailed. who he is, but yeah. tell us. Yeah. Tell well, him uh, Jim, Jim Houston was my Rio when I went through Top Gun. He uh, ended up, when he left the, the military, he went to um, University of Virginia Law School. And he's a first class aviation, uh, an attorney who um, uh, specializes in aviation cases and so forth. Unfortunately, he uh, died a little while ago from, uh, uh, from chronic, uh, can from a cancer, a blood cancer, I can't remember. But uh, anyway, great guy. So after I left Top Gun, I'm out of that. All oh, that's fine. He calls me up and he says, hey, I need an expert witness. That, can you come to a trial for me? I said, sure. What's it about? He said, well, Paramount, uh, Paramount Pictures is claiming that they have the copyright to the name Top Gun. And a company, no kidding, oh my gosh. the nerve of those assholes. So they, uh, there was a, um, uh, an Italian company that built a, a roller coaster for this theme park somewhere. And the name of the roller coaster is Top Gun. So Paramount sues the Italian roller coaster company for using their name. So Houston calls me in as an expert witness to testify to the fact that the name Top Gun was in the public domain before you know, either the movie or the roller coaster was built. And I got into this little, this little sort of jousting, verbal jousting thing with the lawyers for Paramount. Now you guys, you know what it's like to live in a ready room. Yeah. If, if you don't have a quick wit and a sharp tongue, those people are going to eat you alive. So this lawyer had no chance. He's got me and Jim Houston, you know, two guys cut out of the top. We ripped those guys to shreds. You know, the, the, the thing was settled out of court for like four dollars or something. I mean, they just got <laughs> murdered. And uh, so uh, anyway, that's the little side story. I'm sorry. I, I got so many no, stories. No you. problem. I see if you're really you were really smart that you did not provide a beer. If you did, we'd be going on for another hour. <laughs> hey, thanks guys thanks for uh thanks for putting me on your show i appreciate it i hope i didn't embarrass you or say anything stupid but awesome. you, you can edit, perfect you can thank edit you that very out. much for coming i really appreciate it we both really appreciate it thank yeah. you very much thank you what a great interview that was uh powerful and unexpected finish uh to the interview there it, what, what a pleasure 
So uh, one thing that Shoes mentioned in the interview that we'd like to clarify a little bit is the concept of block numbers. A block number is just a group of updates to the aircraft, such as upgrades to radios or maybe angle of attack probes or maybe an upgrade to the ECM suite. So that's all a block number is. And usually it's it's uh, delineated by bureau numbers, you know. Crunch, I got something that I know people are going to be happy about. Our next episode is former Top Gun instructor Jungle Jones talking about the F-14D. And if you want to hear an F-14D supporter, proponent, enthusiast, this is what you're going to want to listen to. Mm-hmm.